today to welcome Dr. Doug Bateman to Arkansas State University. Thank you, Dr. McLean, and uh, thanks to uh, Dean Amansky for inviting me and making me here today. You probably heard it said many times that the Constitution is a work in progress that it contains within, within it ideals, seeds of ideals, that each generation of citizens has to fight to fulfill, and that it's never entirely fulfilled, at least certainly not yet. Thank you. Um, gradually over the years, the idea of citizenship and the rights associated with citizenship have uh, expanded to include more and more people. When we think about the history of that expansion of rights, we're likely to think of such things first as the struggle to abolish slavery, the uh, long civil rights movement of African Americans to do away with Jim Crow laws to win the, or to ensure the right to vote. We're likely to think of the women's rights movement and the uh, right to vote that they won in 1920, and the right to equal access to education, to employment, to equal protection under the laws, that, uh, which is a continuing fight. And there are certain iconic moments and images in, in those histories that most of us know. For example, when Governor George Wallace stood in the doorway of the University of Alabama, blocking the entry of two black students who wanted to register for classes. If you look at photos of this online, you'll see uh, Governor Wallace standing in the, in the doorway, flanked by National Guard troops wearing helmets, and then a board of journalists and photographers and a crowd of onlookers. And what you might not notice uh, in the foreground of most of those photographs is a single step. This little step about this high that you have to step up over to get to that door where Governor Wallace was standing. Well, you might think of the Little Rock Nine walking up the long steps to the Little Rock Central High School. And again, you might not really give any thought to those steps that they're walking up. So for someone who had a mobility impairment, who used a wheelchair, uh, that, that step or those series of steps were, were a barrier, just as formidable as someone standing in the doorway saying no. And we tend not to really think of it in those terms, because it, it seems like an, an act of nature rather than an act of humanity, right? As someone who has been unfortunate and who uses a wheelchair, and then there are certain things that they cannot do. And we might do our best to help those people, but we don't think about those stairs as a decision to prevent the entry of certain types of people. We don't think about the deaf person, or we do now much more than we did, but we didn't think about the deaf person who couldn't walk into the classroom and hear what was going on, because nobody talked about having sign on the interpreters back then. And this was the same at nearly all schools and universities. My first year at the University of Iowa, I taught a class in the history of disability. This was in 1994. It's four years after the Americans with Disabilities Act, after people were supposed to be very aware of these issues. And uh, the university assigned me a classroom in a building that had steps leading up to the door. You went in the door, and there was a series of steps leading back down, and then a long hallway, and you got to the end of the hallway, you walked up another series of steps, and then you got into my classroom. So this was the class they gave to uh, the uh, course in the history of disability. So I told the registrar I needed uh, an accessible classroom, and they moved me to a brand new building, a brand new business building. It was beautiful and well appointed and, and built to be completely accessible. The room had semicircular seating in tiers. So you had to walk up steps to get to the upper tiers, but the lower tier was right there on the floor and uh, inaccessible. It had fixed seats that swung out from the semicircular table, and at each extreme end, they had left out the seats, so there was space for wheelchairs there. So I had two students who used wheelchairs in the class, and about uh, 20 students all together, and the classroom holds 50, 60 students. So naturally, most of the students all go up in the tiers to the center seats. Right? So they're all clustered in the center, and then I have one student over here in the extreme end looking at the side of my head uh, in a wheelchair over here, and one student alone over here. 
at this extreme end. So the classroom is accessible, right? But um, not really equally accessible to everybody. So but that was the best the university uh, could do in that situation. So we just had the students all sit at the extreme ends together so that we didn't have people uh, sitting off by themselves. It's well known that women won the right to vote in 1920, and African Americans had their right to vote protected in the Constitution in 1870, which then uh, didn't work out so well, and ways were found to uh, circumvent that. So again, with the 1968 Voting Act. Um, but still, in the year 2000, a study by the Government Accounting Office found that only 16% of polling places were fully accessible. By 2008, they found considerable improvement, with 27% being fully accessible. There's been continued improvement uh, since then, but a study of the, ninth, of the 2012 election found that 30% of voters with disabilities reported having difficulties voting, either getting into the voting place or, or accessing um, the ballot and, and voting. Uh, and that compared, compares with 8% of voters without disabilities. And that's just the people who went to vote who were talking about having difficulties, because a lot of disabled people don't. Vote. They have much higher non-voting rates than people without disabilities. And this is now 24 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you can imagine how much effort was put into getting people into the voting place and, and being able to vote before the ADA or back earlier in the 20th century and 19th century. Not much. Um, and you can tell similar stories about uh, public accommodations, transportation. We all know about Rosa Parks and her courageous acts, but we don't really know. It's not in, in the history books, generally. The, uh, the strikes that, uh, and the protests that disabled people did in the, in the 70s, lying down in front of buses, surrounding buses with wheelchairs, blocking transit centers, and refusing to let buses move until they got the promises to make buses accessible so that they could get on them and use them. And we know about lunch counter cities, but of course those lunch counters also were inaccessible to disabled people in most restaurants and most theaters and most hotels and bars and concert halls and city halls and courtrooms and so on. Uh, all had barriers to disabled people and many still do. So the topic that I want to talk about today and that I've been working on my research is on recently is a history of immigration policy, which doesn't, on the face of it, seem to be much of a citizenship issue, because really it's, it's more of a human rights issue, the right to migrate. Uh, people who are not allowed to come into the country are not citizens, so they have no citizenship rights. Um, but it's a good measure, a country's laws on immigration are a good measure of how that country thinks <coughs> about citizenship, who they think should be eligible to be a citizen? Who would make a worthy citizen a good citizen? Who should be allowed to come into our place to join us and be members of our group, our nation? So in this way, it's maybe the most basic aspect of the question of citizenship. Who should have the opportunity to be a citizen in the first place? Now, up until late in the 19th century, the US was mostly an open country. Anybody could come in. And Americans typically talked about the right to migrate as a basic uh, liberty, a fundamental liberty. The right to just pick up and go somewhere else and settle down. But this began to change in the 1880s, when the federal government began to first create a set of national policies to govern immigration. The first law in 1882 was to keep out the Chinese. The second law that same year was mainly to keep out people with disabilities. Those were the two first priorities. And after that, there was a, there was a series of laws that uh, tightened up the requirements that posed more and more restrictions. And most of them, practically all of them, for the next three decades, had to do with disability. Some had to do with political radicalism, <coughs> with uh, infectious disease, and um, uh, morality. But the great majority of them were focused on disabilities. And these, these laws really have gotten very little attention from historians 
Before I tell you more about the laws, I want to tell you a story about how uh, some actual people were affected by them. In 1912, Sophie Funko, was a Hungarian woman, who arrived at Ellis Island at the age of 46. Her husband had died four years earlier, and all her other close relatives had migrated to America, so she had decided to come herself uh, to live with her two adult sons, Laszlo and Bella, who were living in North New Jersey. And she brought her small uh, son, six-year-old son, uh, with her, and they arrived at Ellis Island. Her son, Cayman, was hard of hearing or, or deaf, depending on whose story you take. The official said he was deaf, the mother said, no, 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 he's only hard of hearing. Um, but, um, but immediately that was a problem. So the officials, they write up a certificate uh, in which they uh, list the defects or the problems of these particular immigrants. Uh, the son was afflicted with deaf mutism, and the mother, Sophie Foucault, was practically blind in her right eye. So they were both designated as likely to become public charges. That was the language that they used at the time, meaning likely to be unable to support herself and have to go on the dole on charity of some kind. So this meant they had to go before a board, it was called the Board of Special Inquiry, that had three immigration officials who would listen to the evidence and make a decision about whether uh, Sophie Foucault and her son would be allowed to enter the U.S. or be sent back immediately from whence they came. They spent four days in the Ellis Island detention uh, area awaiting a hearing. When the board assembled, Foucault's adult sons from North had come up to testify for her. As was typical, they first talked about her financial standing. She had $20 with her, which wasn't a lot, but it was fairly typical. Most immigrants from uh, from Europe uh, came with something like that. And also, uh, she and her sons stressed that they were there for her if she needed help. If um, she wasn't able to get work in her usual occupation as a housekeeper, um, they would support her. But she emphasized that she had owned her own house in Hungary, and she hadn't been able to sell it yet, but was hoping to sell it and get the money from it. And she'd always been self-supporting, and intended to remain so. Her poor vision and one eye did not affect her work. Her son Laszlo testified that he was working in a cutlery shop earning $18 a week, which was a good salary for the time for a working class job. He had $110 in savings, and he had just spent $170 to pay for his mother and little brother's passage, and spending extra money so they could come in second cabin rather than steerage, which was not a lot of fun. It's no doubt have, uh, have learned. Um, and he had spent money furnishing a home for them, getting it all ready for them to move in. And her other son, um, Bella, was not quite as prosperous. He was earning $7 a week working in a woolen mill and didn't have a lot of cash on hand. But part of that was because he had saved up money to bring uh, his wife from Hungary, who was due to arrive in the next couple of weeks. So this was a working class family that was doing respectably well and working hard to bring everybody together and take care of each other. And under normal circumstances, that would have been fine, right? There would not have been any question about their um, ability to settle and to, uh, and to take care of themselves. But the medical certificates identifying them as defectives uh, meant that these were not normal circumstances. So the board decided that Pupo and her son were both, quote, suffering from physical defects the nature of which will affect their ability to earn a living. They are likely to become public charges and they were ordered uh, deported. Now, immigrants often didn't know this, but they had a right to uh, appeal to uh, the Secretary of the Department of Commerce and, Lab and Labor in Washington, which the Immigration Bureau was under. Um, and um, Sophie Foucault uh, did appeal and, and wrote an appeal letter to the Secretary. Emphasizing again that she'd always been self-supporting. Her sons were uh, earning good wages. They would post bonds to guarantee she wouldn't become a public charge or her son. And she appealed to his sympath sympathy, emphasizing that she had no one left to be hungry. That there was nothing for her to return to. The Commissioner of Immigration, Ellis Island, also in these cases would write a letter to forward along with the Secretary. Um, and the commissioner at that time was William Williams, who had built a, a reputation 
a very strict enforcer of the immigration laws, and particularly those related to physical and mental defects. So in his letter, he urged the secretary to dismiss the appeal, arguing, quote, her child will always be physically defective, and it would be improper to admit merely because of the relatives here. Then there was the Commissioner General of Immigration in Washington, D.C., who also uh, added his uh, recommendation to the file, saying the Bureau does not think that there is any good ground for admitting these physically defective aliens. So the Secretary took all this together and considered and uh, dismissed the appeal. So Sophie Fuko and her son were put on board the USS Pennsylvania on December 21st and returned to Hungary. The, the thing about doing this kind of research that's so um, frustrating and poignant is you don't know what happens to these people. Because once they leave, once they're deported, they leave the stage of history, they just become private citizens somewhere else and they have no record. But for uh, most of these people, most people who came were not well-to-do, and, and most of them sold whatever they had in order to uh, pay the passage and have money to get set up here. Um, a lot of them had come as part of a chain migration, right? It was very common for people who lived in the same town or relatives, um, both close and distant relatives, would come one after another and then set up in some kind of loose network and community in the United States. So a lot of people like, well, like Sophie Fuko, having only $20 uh, for their name to go back with, having gotten rid of everything, left their jobs, and, and often had no family uh, to return to. But we can only imagine what their fate was when they uh, were sent back. We don't know. The law that Fuko and her son were deported uh, under was the 1907 Immigration Act. As I mentioned, they started these laws in 1882. The very first law, uh, other than the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, prohibited entry to any lunatic or idiot. Now these are the these were not insulting terms that weren't meant to be insulting at the time. These were the terms of, of science uh, at that time. Um, so lunacy was what later became insanity, which became mental illness. And, um, and idiocy was a term that uh, applied to people with intellectual disabilities, and it was considered the worst form, the lowest grade, as they would say, of, uh, of feeble-mindedness, which was the general term that they used. So people who were considered to be lunatics or idiots were automatically excluded. And that category of what they call mental defects was gradually expanded over the years. So in 1903, well, they replaced lunacy with insanity in the law, and people with epilepsy were added. And then in 1907, they added imbeciles and all feeble-minded persons. So they were going from that the lowest grade, as I would say, of idiocy up to the next grade of imbecility. It's interesting how these terms uh, migrate into popular culture and become insults, isn't it? So, not too long after this mental retardation came into uh, into common usage, and of course that very soon became uh, an insult, and so that's not used anymore. We use uh, intellectual disability. It seems like that's going to be a harder one to turn into a, a quick insult uh, to hurl at somebody. Um, but any feeble-minded person, um, so it's a very vague expansive category, and of course it's dependent upon immigration officials judging people pretty quickly. And in 1917, uh, Congress gave up on these, um, what they hoped were trying to be more or less precise categories, and simply said that uh, all persons with any mental abnormality, whatever, should be excluded. And the regulations that were attached to this explained that this was a means of excluding aliens of a mentally inferior type without being under the necessity of showing that they have a defect which may affect their ability to earn a living. So, regardless of any effect on your um, ability to support yourself. Also, any borderline mental case which might be described as mentally deficient or slow-witted or having mental dullness should also be automatically excluded 
And then in 1917, they added, in that same year actually, in the same year 1917, they added the diagnosis of constitutional psychopathic inferiority. And this was described as various unstable individuals on the borderline between sanity and insanity, and persons with abnormal sex instincts. So this was the law under which gays and lesbians were excluded um, for a very long time, until very recently. Immorality, by the way, was seen as a kind of mental defect. It was talked about as a faculty that could be impaired uh, in some way, and was related to other kinds of mental defects, intellectual defects, and whatnot. The second part of 1882 law, and then the laws that came after, had to do with this public charge thing, right? It become a public charge. And this was meant to keep out people with physical disabilities. So it was up to the officials who were inspecting to look at a person and decide whether their physical disability, their physical defect, would interfere with their ability to earn a living. And at first they used the phrase, unable to take care of himself or herself without becoming a public charge. Then in 1891, they changed it to likely to become a public charge. And then in 1907, they said anyone with any kind of defect that may affect the ability to earn a living uh, should be excluded. So this, this category of exclusion grew larger and larger over the years and more and more flexible and more and more expansive. The immigration officials were given a long list of defects that could be caused for exclusion. I won't read the whole list because it would take me 10 minutes. But a few examples were arthritis, asthma, bunions, deafness, deformities, flat feet, heart disease, hernia, hysteria, poor eyesight, poor physical development, spinal curvature, and varicose veins. The Ellis Island chief medical inspector wrote that his chief task, the chief task of his job, was to detect poorly built, defective, or broken down human beings. And the commissioner general of immigration wrote in 1907 that the exclusion of this country of morally, mentally, and physically deficient as the principal object would be uh, accomplished by the immigration laws. So what were they so afraid of? I mean, you think of people that you know with disabilities who would not have been allowed into the country because they were defective persons and posed some kind of danger to the country. The other thing that you should know is the passage of these laws was not an isolated kind of development at all. This was a time period in which social attitudes toward people with disabilities were turning dramatically more negative. In the U.S., as in most other industrialized countries, thousands of people were segregated into institutions, were involuntarily sterilized, prohibited from marrying by marriage laws. There were popular books and articles and films even that advocated the euthanasia of disabled infants, killing uh, disabled infants, and it was practiced by a fair number of physicians. It wasn't legal, but it was simply assumed that, uh, that this would be done. And there was a fairly robust movement to try to make it a legal requirement that doctors should do this. There's a, a silent film called The Black Stork, um, made in the 1920s, that um, you might be able to find online. It's pretty fascinating, where it lays out the whole case for euthanizing disabled or defective uh, infants. At the same time, it was becoming harder and harder for disabled people to get jobs because of the general stigmatization of disability. A lot of cities around the country passed unsightly beggar laws, as they were called, that prohibited people with visible disabilities from begging on the streets because it upset passers, passers by. So this is all part of what was called the eugenics movement. It was a movement to improve the human stock by taking under conscious control and public control who reproduced and who uh, didn't reproduce. And this is the danger, I think, of ranking types of people, of categorizing people. It often leads to this kind of thing. In the United States, it led to institutionalization and sterilization. Uh, the Nazis in Germany uh, took it a lot farther. Now, the Holocaust started with the killing of people in institutions, people with intellectual and mental disabilities. And then from there moved on to the Jews, who were also considered to be defective type people, and moved on to the Roma and to homosexuals and on and on. At the same time that 
These other things were going on. There was a campaign to end the use of sign language by deaf people which led to its prohibition in most uh, classrooms, in most schools for the deaf. Using sign language made deaf people stand out, look abnormal, um, and there was less and less tolerance for that. But also the danger was that deaf people who signed supposedly would only marry each other, and them not understanding the science of heredity very well yet, um, they assumed that this would lead to a lot of deaf children. So they thought if they required deaf people to learn to speak, and read lips that they would associate more hearing people and be more likely uh, to marry a hearing person. Most deaf people weren't really able to do this. People who were born deaf um, found it very difficult to ever speak so that they could be understood or to read lips well enough that you could just live an ordinary life uh, communicating in that way. But most deaf students, it seems strange today, they were forced to sit in classrooms where they couldn't understand the teacher most of the time. And the teacher often couldn't understand them, even though uh, he or she was an expert at understanding deaf speech. And those who failed at this were stigmatized with the educational label of oral failure. So someone who's an oral failure, at some point, maybe in high school, would be put into a vocational track and allowed to use sign language where they would learn to. Uh, to, to repair shoes or be a dressmaker or something of that sort. And by the way, this was white deaf students only. The schools in the South, um, the schools of the deaf were still segregated, just like um, the public schools. And the black schools kept on using sign language. This was mainly because shifting over to oral methods cost a fair bit of money. In these smaller class, classes, because getting too close to you to read your lips. Um, so the black schools continue using sign language, and the irony is that they uh, probably got a better education, even though they were underfunded and had far fewer teachers and lacked books and whatnot, because they had better communication with their teachers. Julie, Julian Bond, you know, the, the great civil rights leader, came to the University of Iowa in the 80s to give a speech, and at that time I was working as a sign language interpreter. And we were chatting beforehand, and he told me that uh, his grandmother taught at a school for the deaf in the 30s and 40s. And in the 40s, when he was growing up, he used to spend time at his grandmother's house, and she always had deaf students around. And they all signed. And uh, he said he learned some sign language uh, growing up and used to communicate with deaf people. So he was fascinated by sign language because of his own history. But... So, enough digression. The fear that led to all of this was the fear of defects being passed along, people reproducing their defects, and a degeneration, degeneration of the human race. And so this was uh, the reason they didn't want deaf people to be associated with each other. That's why they put people in institutions so that they couldn't reproduce. They, put, they sterilized people so they couldn't reproduce. And they kept out defective immigrants because they didn't want defective immigrants coming in and diluting or spoiling the blood of the American stock. Um, but the way they usually put it, this, when people talked about immigration restrictions, they talked about this a lot, this was a central concern. But when they put it in the law, the terminology they used was not being able to support yourself, it was a financial matter. And historians, for the most part, have just taken that for granted, that that you know, makes sense, they want to keep people out for economic reasons. But there are several problems with that. One, of course, is it just takes for granted the idea that disabled people are unable to work productively. This is um, the traditional idea of disability, is that it's something that happens to your body that makes your life more difficult. Rather than, as we talk about in disability studies today, there's a relationship between you and an environment, a social environment, so that if you are in a situation where your disability is not uh, an impediment, you're not really disabled. So a deaf person, say, at Gallaudet University, where everybody signs, doesn't really experience having a disability, because they can communicate with everyone. A person in a wheelchair, where everything is ramped, or, or elevators, instead of with, to go with stairs doesn't really experience disability because the ability is to get around. Walking is not really the important thing, it's getting around. And so disability arises in a relationship between a particular kind of body that is not taken account of in a society 
and, uh, and the environment, including the built environment, social environment, and so on. And there are always people with disabilities. Disabilities are normal, right? It's not that most people have disabilities, but every community has people with disabilities. Disabilities have always been with us. It's a completely normal occurrence. So the problem is when we don't take account of that, of that diversity. But even if you left that whole analysis aside of disability, the economic explanation just doesn't work because people were excluded all the time because they were strange, abnormal, defective. Who could work? Who had always worked? Like Sophie Foucault, the housekeeper. Um, another example is a man named Moisha Fishman who arrived at Ellis Island on December 23rd, 1913. He was 30 years old and he had supported himself as an iron worker and blacksmith in Russia since he was 14. He came to America to join his brother and sister, both of whom were employed and doing very well. He was um, brought to a hearing where his siblings as well as three cousins came to speak on his behalf, one of them carrying a letter from their employer offering him a job. And all of them promised that if he had any difficulties at all, they were there to support him. Now, Fishman was not able to testify at his, uh, at his own hearing. The, the staff at Ellis Island included dozens of interpreters who knew languages, spoken languages, all over the world and tried to accommodate people from wherever they came from in the world. But those interpreters did not include anybody who did any of the sign languages of the world, and Moisha Fishman was deaf. So he was not able to testify on his own behalf, his brother and sister did, but to no avail, the board voted unanimously to send him back to Russia, stating in the record that his certified condition is such that he would have difficulty acquiring or retaining employment. And actually, the fact was deaf people didn't have trouble finding jobs. Deaf people were quite successful during this time period at finding work, factory work. <coughs> Was, was open to deaf people, and a lot of employers actually preferred deaf workers. They said they were better workers, and they would actually intersperse them with hearing workers so that they wouldn't talk on the job, so they would focus on their work. But anyway, there wasn't high on one for deaf people, so this simply wasn't true. Um, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society came to his assistance and helped him to write an appeal to Washington. Saying, after all, the work of a blacksmith does not require the faculty of speech, but rather the possession of muscle and strength, and this he has. We do not see how he can be termed a person likely to become a public charge with all his relatives eager to help him, nor how the fact that he's a deaf mute will affect his ability to earn a living, especially since he has always earned his own support in the past. But the Commissioner General of the Bureau of Immigration responded, there can be little doubt that his certified condition will seriously interfere with his earning capacity. This was just an assumption, really. Disabilities meant dependence, and they just had this kind of ideal in mind, right? It's just like, at the time, people also talked about women as not being self-supporting. Now, thousands, millions of women were in the workplace because they had to be. The middle class ideal was the woman stayed at home. She was domestic and took care of the family. And so with that ideal in mind, they also didn't let women in who were single, even if they had always worked. Uh, for a living, because the ideal was that women were dependent, and therefore they had to come with a man upon whom they were dependent, a father or a husband. So it was the same thing with disabled people. They were understood as dependent, regardless of uh, what was actually the reality. Fishman's an interesting case, because as I told you, usually they just leave the uh, stage of history when they go back, but Fishman ended up uh, returning years later and telling his story about what happened. He, he got deported. He didn't want to go back to Russia because Russia for Jews at this time was a very dangerous and unpleasant place. So he went to Belgium where he found steady work uh, until the First World War started and during the siege of Antwerp, the Belgian government uh, conscripted him to dig trenches. And when the Germans uh, overran Antwerp, he fled with other refugees eventually ending up in a refugee camp in London, where a British uh, philanthropist who was doing refugee work 
uh, discovered him, took an interest in him, corresponded with his family in America, and um, learning of their desire to have him join them, he paid for his passage to New York. And so in 1915, he again found himself at Ellis Island, going through the exact same process. He was again certified as afflicted with a physical defect, went before the board, same people came and testified, all of them a little more prosperous now, his family was doing quite well. Uh, still ordered deported, did an appeal, same process, but what saved him in 1915 was that the Germans were sinking ships all over the Atlantic with their U-boats, right? And U-boat uh, warfare meant that you didn't take uh, survivors, you didn't take the passengers off the ship as uh, the older warships would do. They would always unload the passengers first before they sunk the ship. But you both didn't do that because you were at the bottom. And so the Immigration Bureau was very loath to send somebody back uh, on a ship, and there weren't many ships um, going anyway. Um, so even though the immigration officials um, wrote that it was an unfortunate circumstance and they really didn't like the fact that they had to admit him, they really didn't see uh, any choice. And so after this long adventure, circuitous adventure, he was in America and became uh, an American. But this was a case of a man who had always been self-supporting and who had this tremendous difficulty getting into the country. Poor physique was another diagnosis that was commonly used, and it was a real problem for Jewish immigrants, because a lot of Orthodox Jews had sedentary uh, occupations, right? a, lot of, a lot of tailors, people who did sitting hand work, so they tended not to be the most robust of people. There was a stereotype of Jews that they were weak and they were neurotic, and we talked about this a lot. And then on top of that, uh, Orthodox Jews could not eat on the ships. There, was, there wasn't food there that they, could, uh, that they could eat. And so they had to bring whatever they were going to eat on this long, several week voyage. Right? And so they tended to arrive emaciated. I mean, most people actually arrived in not very good shape if they were in steerage. It was uh, a place that was full of you know, coughing, people spreading. Their illnesses, very overcrowded, very hot, poor food, spoiled food often. So a lot of people arrived looking bad, and Orthodox Jews arrived looking especially bad. And so people were rejected for, for physique. There was a man named Israel Bosak in 1906, who had been a tailor in Russia. There were pogroms going on at that time, that is to drive the Jews out, and his tailor shop had been burnt down in a pogrom. And so he decided to emigrate to come to the United States and then he would send for his family once he got uh, established. And there was a member of the board who was himself Jewish and very interested in these uh, issues and made a speech which generally didn't do on the board. But he said, this alien has come here driven from his home by the mom. He comes here to establish a home for himself and a family. A man who has once been possessed of a home and property and a business seems to me valuable material for immigration. Seems to me nothing but more than the simplest humanity to permit him to enter. I move his admission. But the other two members of the board did not go along um, with that. And uh, uh, Bosak was sent back to, uh, to Russia to, again, whatever fate awaited him there. I want to close by talking about how these ideas about disability did not just affect disabled people. They passed a series of laws, and then in 1924 they passed a quota act, which set very strict quotas on each country of origin, how many people could come in, and the quotas were especially strict on those countries that had inferior types of people living in them. So Italy, for example. Italian immigrants were not welcome because they were inferior types of people, so they had a very strict quota. People from Eastern Europe, people of the Slavic race, who were known, known to be people-minded, or more often than other people. Um, they had strict quotas. Uh, Jews, who were known to have poor physique and to be neurotic, had strict quotas um, put on them. And the way that 
this law was argued for, the way it was advocated, was to talk about the defects of these various people. It was to attribute disabilities to them. They established already that it was a good idea and broadly acceptable to set laws restricting defective people, keeping defective people out of the country. So the next step was to define certain races as inherently defective or more prone to defect than other races. And therefore, and part of the problem was inspection was so cost, costly and difficult and time consuming that that was a hard way to keep people out. So instead they put these blanket restrictions on people from what they call the inferior races. There was, there was an Irish race, an Italian race, and a Slavic race. They used the word race differently at the time than we tend to today. Um, so they were keeping out those degenerate and psychopathic types from the inferior nations. And this is a common rhetorical maneuver through history. When people were arguing over slavery in the 19th century, one of the most common arguments in favor of slavery was that African Americans had impaired intelligence, impaired logic, and impaired ability to think, impaired motivation uh, to work. They had inferior and uh, inferior organisms and constitutional weaknesses. They talked all the time about their bodies and minds being impaired. And the other part of this argument was that in slavery they were okay, but if you freed them, the stress of living in the outside world competing with white people would cause them to break down and they would become disabled. And they actually had lots of evidence for this. Um, there was a New York medical journal that reported that deafness was three times more common and blindness twice as common among free blacks in the North as it was among black slaves in the South. John C. Calhoun used this, the senator from uh, South Carolina, one of the most influential spokespersons for, uh, for the slave states, argued that, quote, the number of deaf and dumb, blind, idiots, and insane of the Negroes in the states that have changed the ancient relation between the races that, is, that have abolished slavery it is seven times higher than in the slave states. And this turned up in a lot of medical journals, too. There's all sorts of medical journals in both the South and the North. So the point was, number one, African Americans are inherently defective and therefore belong in slavery. And also, that if we free African Americans from slavery, they're just going to become disabled anyway, which is a fate worse than slavery. So we do them a favor by keeping them in slavery. And the same kind of arguments continued after the Civil War. People were researching the breakdown of the African body under the conditions of freedom in, uh, in prominent medical journals. Same kinds of arguments were made over uh, women's right to vote or women's political equality. Women were described as being physically weaker, more likely to break down under stress. They had emotional impairments. They were incapable of thinking logically about political questions. They'd be swayed by their emotions because women were creatures of emotion. And they were emotionally unbalanced. They were prone to hysteria and to over-excitement. Um, and they had the mental disabilities, the inability to think problem through logically to its logical end. There was also the argument that they would become disabled if they had political rights. Um, women have great temperamental disabilities. They lack endurance in things mental. They lack nervous stability. Participation in politics will lead to nervous prostration, prostration and hysteria. Women's education, educating women in the way that men are educated, will lead them to become uh, unable to reproduce. They will dwarf their reproductive organs, as people say. The reproductive organs are dwarfed, deformed, weakened, and diseased by excessive education. And so the answer was special education. Right? Special education for women that was suited to their weaker bodies and special, special needs. And people who wrote with authority on the woman question, as they called it at the time, right? were doctors. Doctors who were writing all the time on the woman question, on questions of political equality and um, political participation. So the larger point is that disability is just everywhere in history. It's all over the place and it's used as a justification for inequality. For disabled people, yes, but also because we accept the, the naturalness of inequality for disabled people.
you can use that same kind of argument to discredit other people as well by attributing uh, disability to them. So it's a warning, I think, that when we talk about people as types, and then talk about whether different types are deserving of citizenship or capable of citizenship, we're going down a very dangerous road. The citizenship itself should not be ever a question of ability, of what you deserve, of what you're capable of. It simply matters that you're a human being living in this nation, and that, uh, that is enough to be a citizen. Thank you very much. Uh, 
someone who helped to legitimize those ideas in, in her circles. Anything else? Um, I was wondering how they would uh, determine whether you were an idiot or whether you were um, had a certain disability, whether it was more based on the quotas by race or if they had, I would doubt that they would have like in-depth analysis. I would assume that would cost money. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So in 1924, they had the racial quotas, and they also kept the same inspection system. So that's after 24. Before that, it was all based on judging the person's desirability in terms of their, their mind, their body, their morality, um, their political orientation. And most of this, of course, you couldn't see, right? They, they barred... Um, anarchists from coming to the country, but most anarchists didn't come in and say, hi, I'm an anarchist. Like, you know. So they, it's very rare that they're able to exclude people for that. As for um, disabilities generally, you know, on some days, there were thousands of people streaming through Ellis Island and other ports, and they couldn't inspect everybody individually. This was one of the reasons it just didn't work all that well, and they went to racial quotas. So they had inspectors who were just eyeballing people as they went by. They were physicians, and they prided themselves on being able to make snapshot diagnoses. But they'd be able to spot a clue to some underlying defect or disease or something, right? And they had a lot of crack thought theories about the shape of the ears indicating certain kinds of mental illnesses, or uh, the, the shape of the eyes, or how widely spaced the eyes were, and various things like that. But once they spotted someone who looked a little abnormal, they, they moved in a way that marked them as something wrong, or they acted, they were agitated, or seemed nervous, or anything that made them stand out, they'd be pulled aside and then given a complete inspection. Now, in the early years, for um, idiocy, imbecility, legal-mindedness, they just talked to the person and kind of figured it out in their own best judgment, which was a problem, because a lot of people were peasants from rural, southern Italy or from you know, rural Poland, and they had different ways of thinking and talking about things, and often those cultural differences would, would, um, would result in a diagnosis of feeble-mindedness. Um, but it was, it was a very haphazard kind of, kind of system, and especially that first picking people out of the line to inspect them was, was very haphazard. And so if you had a visible abnormality, you were at a real disadvantage. Because even if you had something visible that wouldn't exclude you, you were going to be inspected, looked at closely, and you might discover something else. So you wanted to look as normal as you could. And immigrants talk about this all the time, you know, about covering up limps, carrying your jacket so that you cover up the fact that your arm is kind of stiff or something, figuring out ways to um, Carrying, uh, carrying your child, a uh, child who has difficulty walking or something. Various strategies to try to get past the inspectors. Can I answer your question? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, where are we? Do we need to... I've lost your watch. <laughs> we have time for more? Maybe one more. Okay. Anybody want one more question? Yeah, we've got a couple more. No? If not, then thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for your good questions. Great.